Copper is uh, definitely an, an interesting story to say the least. But Deep Value Co. told me that we maybe don't need as high of a copper price as a lot of us may be expecting. So in this short clip, I'll show you the part of the conversation that I had with him where he explained to me why he thinks that. Uh, but if you want to watch the, the full one hour plus podcast, you can do that on baby-investments.com. As always, it is 100% free, no login required, and there aren't any ads on that full interview either. So you can watch or listen to it in the background without any interruptions. Uh, as always, though, I beg you not to make any decisions based on what I have to say here. I'm new to investing. I'm not very smart, and I don't have enough experience to back up any of my claims. I'm simply here to document my learning journey, share some of my opinions, and hopefully get some feedback on them so that I can improve. So please always, always do your own research as I cannot and must not be relied on. This is very serious. Uh, but anyway, now let's see what DV had to say about copper. I guess let's just do like a, a short overview. I'm going to do like a short overview on why people are, are bullish in copper and where most of this is coming from. And then we can jump in, in in sort of your contrarian view, which I'm really looking forward to hearing here. Is that is that something you, is, is that okay to do it like that? Works for me. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess where, where most of this is coming from is, is the demand narrative. And uh, first of all, as a point already here, I'm, I'm always careful to jump into, into, the, into the belief for demand because, uh, you know, the, the belief for demand narrative. I'd much rather have, a, you know, a clear and a clean supply story where we know that supply is limited or um, we're just not going to have enough supply because that, that is oftentimes easier to understand, at least to, to someone like me. And it's also less risky for, uh, I guess, for as far as I get it. And but so... Right before I call here, I read an article on mining.com saying that uh, with, with green transition becoming a key economic, um, a key theme for economic development, fancy words here, for the next decade or so, they say. And then they were talking about Fitch Solutions, who um, apparently forecasts 13% annual growth over the next decade for, um, for the demand for copper, right? So you know, this also sounds like a, a big demand story over here. And But with copper, though, it is also supported by a supply story, which says that we haven't had enough or, or barely barely any really mine development over the last decade. So um, I guess what attracts a lot of people is the fact that uh, supply is very limited. And it's also going to take a while before, uh, I guess, before new supply comes online, right? But we also have this this big demand narrative and um, for a very strong demand growth over the next decade or even more. So um, I guess, you know, you told me that you don't think it's, it's that simple of a story. And, and uh, I also think that I might be missing something here because every person that I speak to is bullish on copper. So what is your view on all of that, DV? Well, in the way you phrased it and the way I kind of think about it is kind of the same. And fundamentally... I am bullish copper demand. I don't know if I'm as bullish as plus well, 13% a year because um, that seems a bit extreme to me, um, especially when you consider you know, price is going to matter and that type of thing. But when we're talking about supply on the copper side, it's not... It, first of all, it would be much slower than 13%. But if you're talking about a reasonable kind of traditional growth story in copper, well, there there is supply. And we have been growing copper supply and we will continue to and probably need more. But the question becomes, what price makes sense for that? And for me, you can look at, well, what was the price we had for most of the past decade and around 250 ish um, you know it's, it's been two dollars been three dollars but if you go around 250 and that's been getting us a little bit of growth not arguably not enough growth so if we're talking about ex accelerating growth going forward we need a higher price okay but the price now is closer to 450 than 250 and when we're looking at miners, that means a lot more margin. If you go from 250 to three bucks, it probably doubles 
the the profits for the miners. So if we're going from 250 to almost 450, that's almost a fourfold increase in the amount of money that the copper miners can then invest in future supply. So the little bit of growth, even by now, if you project forward what what this price environment would mean, you get a lot more growth than what you've been getting in the past. And, you know, it's not as simple as, okay, here we are, this is all the copper we can produce, and then we're out. Because when you look forward at, A, we get new mines, B, there's plenty, there's a lot of investment in copper. I won't go out and say, oh, there's too much investment in copper right now and we're going to have way too much. No, but in a sustained price environment of $4, $4.50, well, if you project that out a longer period of time, you're going to arrive at a point where you get a whole lot more copper than we were at in the past. And meanwhile, if you rewind back to 2018, the utilization rate in copper mines it was around 85%. So in the meantime, it's not like this is all the copper we can produce. Maybe in the short term it is because of disruptions here and there, but copper is not exactly rare. And with given adequate investment, you're seeing, if you look around, there's a lot of um, nice drill holes that you're seeing from the investment that comes from $3 copper. And we're at 4 so you do think that supply is going to be coming online slower than 13% per year compound annual growth rate, right? Right. So it, it price, basically every price that you get for copper or really any commodities translates to, you know, if that was a price forever, you'd get a set amount of supply. And so if we're talking about, you know, what does $3 copper get you? Well, it gets you so much, assuming that was the price forever. What does 350 copper get you? More than that. Meanwhile, less demand because the price is a bit higher. But if we're talking like as, as we go higher and higher, the expectations for the demand that will be needed to take up all of the supply that the price would bring keep getting higher. So really, once the prices move, expectations are moving as well. And so that's kind of the question of not will there be any growth, but how much growth is today's price looking at? I guess that's the biggest question, right? And um, I'm thinking, you mentioned 250. You know, if you, if you adjust that for inflation, it becomes a little bit more like what maybe 3 over $3. And I guess that's also been the problem is that price doesn't really take into account uh, CapEx at first. And, and also um, something else that I've recently been thinking about is a, a reasonable return to shareholders. I mean, Reasonable return to people who trade stocks is something else than actual shareholders of the company who are maybe involved in it. Because imagine buying a copper mine, you would you would want some sort of a margin, right? And if if those producers are not coming online at, at two fifty inflation adjusted three or three fifty, maybe that's because they want a, a larger margin. So are you where do you expect copper price to to settle at for a sustained supply that can also match the demand well when we're talking about where the price needs to be to get more supply i don't think it necessarily needs to be much higher than let's call it 350 i mean always adjust you know because we don't know how much inflation there's going to be so always adjust the numbers i'm kind of throw out there adjust them for inflation but i don't think it needs to be higher than 350 you look at all of the the studies done the technical reports you know some use 275 some use three bucks some use 303 some high ones use 320 but when you look at a lot of them, a lot of the ones for the serious, the big projects, the tier one, maybe tier two projects, um, f- the, the prices we're seeing these days are off the scale in terms of what they use for their technical reports. So mm-hmm. while, you know, I don't think you need more than $3 or 350 to get significantly more supply, 
you know, it, it wouldn't shock me. It, I mean, we're at above $4 and it would not shock me to be above $4 when, because as you say, you need the incentive price, you need to account for the risk, you need to account for price overshoots and building the mine, you need to account for inflation. There's all these things. But even including that, I mean, four dollars three fifty because look at you know i mean what i can say is just look at the technical reports that the companies use they say okay three dollar copper we can make billions of dollars we can have an adequate return make billions of dollars and then extend the mine life to make even more money so i don't think the price needs to be at some of the the, the higher projections that i've seen can it go some of the way there i mean can it go to five dollars I think it can, but can it stay at $5? I don't think it can if we're talking extended periods of time. As, as someone who, who recently, um, before, before COVID, actually bought a business, I, I was really focusing on the margins um, and you know, bought an actual physical business. I'm already in the process of selling it, by the way, but long story short, I was looking at the margins. And I guess where a big difference what will make a very big difference for copper prices is whether the new supply that will be matching that 13 percent growth in demand will be coming from existent miners or will it be coming from new miners because when i was looking to get into the restaurant business i, I was i wasn't really necessarily looking to get into the restaurant business i was looking to deploy some of my capital you know take a high risk investment because I'm at a young age and I was looking at different businesses and I was comparing mostly the profit margins. And so I'm thinking in order for, you know, companies that are not involved in copper to start being involved in copper, start developing mines, maybe you no know, buy an exploration project that's um, closer to a PEA or whatever, they would only jump in if the margins are attractive to them. But the existing companies are not necessarily going to produce copper only if the margins are attractive to them. They're already producing copper, which means that they're already okay with the margins. So I guess the margins matter less to the existing producers than they matter to new producers. So I guess the question here is, where do you think supply is going to be coming from? From the existent miners? Or do you think that new miners are going to join the copper space and, and start producing copper? Well, big question. But the simple the simple part of the first part of the answer i would go with is we will need new projects eventually i don't know if next year or whatever cuz there's there is a long um lead time in in terms of before you know exploration development then construct sorry construction and production and so we will need new projects that is you know if we're going to get growth if we're going to get a lot of growth we're going to need new projects now we are finding new projects and i'm not again i'm not going to say we're finding enough right now but price sends signals so if you know if price falls all the way to three i think we still get plenty of or a lot of um, investment in new early exploration projects why well because again three is plenty of uh, it's traditionally adjusted for inflation a adequate to high copper price um you know not an exciting cycle or anything but high enough to incentivize production in new mines now the other part is as as you put once the the capex once the capital is sunk then it becomes a matter of all in sustaining or cash costs and that's when you kind of look at the cost curve in terms of after they re you know because they need to recoup the investment and then after that that's what they really have to deal with so i mean the cost curve on on purely on that basis much of it is around 150 to 250 all in sustaining so that's kind of the off switch, if you will. Um, it, let's say we have too much copper, too much production, and you know the market just says no mass, no more. Mm -hmm. Well, then the price would need to go uh, to uh, find a level that would tell them tell the market to turn off. And so that's traditionally that's kind of 
how I look at the downside. Like what if things go bad? What if, you know, there's no growth, something happens, disaster, economic downturn, something like that. What would, where would that take copper? And that's where you look at the cost curve and you say, okay, well, $2, $2.30, something like that. And, you know, that's what we saw. And if you look at the cost curve, it makes a lot of sense. Whereas 90% on the cost curve. And that's, that's a traditional uh, marker for the downside of, of copper. The 90th percentile in terms of uh, the cost curve. And if you look at the last cycle, and this is something that a lot of people uh, will talk about, like, you know, they'll assume that the last cycle is basically, we're going to see a repeat of that. The cost, the 90th percentile on the cost curve in the last cycle went from 80 cents to around $2.50. Costs rocketed. Why? Well, a whole bunch of reasons. Just inflation, there was uh, commodity prices going up, so inputs were going up. But since then, it's actually lower. The cost has come down. Why? Because of investment, because the higher price mines were shutting down. Um, but really, if you look at the demand growth story last time, there was supply growth with it. But the reason that the price has stayed in the top range is because costs are significantly higher than they were in you know the period from the 80s to 2000. Because really, if you look at before the last super boom, prices went nowhere for 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's just because new supply, by the way, supply growth over that time basically did not stop mm-hmm. even when the prices of copper was a dollar 20 so it really matters the margin margin matters if you can get more copper for the for a dollar like if the marginal producer was at a dollar you know price wouldn't need to be higher than dollar 50 but so you have to look at what it would take to get more copper and the technical reports will tell you three dollars so that's um because that's where you get an adequate return on the costs and i'm pretty sure i wandered off a bit from your question but back to to, to sunk capital you know the high price is what causes the capital to be sunk and then from there you're right it's what's the off switch? Where does, you know, what would cause the business to, to stop functioning? And that is where the, the cycle will find its bottom. To go back to something that you previously said, mentioned a couple of times was uh, inflation. And I know you're an inflation bitter yourself. Um, I mean, you, you told me that you think that inflation is speaking probably uh, worth a different video itself. But what if you're wrong about inflation? What if what if inflation goes into the to the to the low tens in percent, right? Uh, you know, the cost of building a mine, the cost of operating a mine, the the, the fuel, you know, everything is going to go up in price. And so I'm thinking, if the if the producers or developers are already baking that in, they might be hesitant to start building out new mines or start, you know, newcomers might be hesitant to join the copper market at four dollars. They might be waiting for six or higher prices. Because they know, I mean, if, if they're anticipating it, they know that in the near term, their oil and sustaining costs will, will go up drastically. So that 350 that you mentioned could become, you know, a lot more. It could become 450 5 dollars maybe. And so I'm thinking, couldn't that postpone production and sort of push the price even higher so that, so, so that they become incentivized to, to go into, into, you know, to, to, to go into the production uh, despite expectations for high inflation. So, so just in general, yeah, what do you, what do you think? Where, where are you baking inflation in all of this? So, yeah, um, that's a very good point. And you're right, it, it could, if there was sustained high inflation, that would um, hurt the likelihood of new miners to sink the capital because they realize that, you know, you look at uh, Turquoise Hill, uh, you don't want that type of, you know, you sink, a bunch of money and then you realize it's going to cost a whole lot more i mean that's common but um that's i mean that one particularly is a technical mess more than um more than inflation but you're very you're very accurate there are um often 
costs end up being higher, more capital is needed, and this is worse when there's when there's higher inflation. But the thing is, if there's inflation, generally that's a sign. Generally, but not always, that's a sign of str- stronger economies, like the economy getting stronger. Which, in terms of for copper, would generally mean the price would go- become stronger as you're building a mine than increasing leverage. But you can also, I mean, there's also abilities to hedge to varying degrees. So overall, you know, you talk about costs going up, and that's why I said before, all of what I, the numbers I shoot out are inflation adjusted. So if there's a lot of inflation, they'd go higher. If there's deflation, which is unlikely in the strictest sense, um, they would go lower. Yeah, inflation is another monkey wrench that could be thrown in the whole thing but as a whole you know companies can can only adjust so much because let's say let's say there's more inflation let's say it takes three years to build a mine let's say 10 percent inflation this is very aggressive um well three dollar copper becomes three dollars and thirty cents in one year and so, yeah, I mean, I mean, again, as long as the, the entire cost curve is moving, the, it, it's a tricky question and I, it, it, there's no simple, simple answer for that. I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of adjusting for inflation. Yeah. I think also s- s- mean, there's also the, the thesis about the deposits that were going to get developed that we're going to get easily developed, they are already developed. The ones that are left to be developed, they're challenged in one way or another. I mean, look at Oracle. They've been in a legal battle for 10 years. So how long does it take to develop a mine? Well, you can say three years because that's, that's, the, that, you know, that, that's the labor that you need to build it out. But what if it's like a really challenged deposit in a really challenged um, jurisdiction where political situations are changing and so on and so forth. And, you know, so the price moves and then uh, I I guess that could also slow down the the supply of copper, right? Yes, that's very, very true. And that's always why I kind of look at, look at price from a very long-term perspective. And I say like, if the price is here forever or for 10 years or for 20 years or whatever, you'd get the supply because in the short term there's disruptions there's you know transport disruptions there's permitting there's tons and tons of issues on the individual company side um but when you take the price longer term and that's that's why you know right now even though the utilization rate isn't even 100 percent, and there's new mines being built we're still seeing prices 50 almost like 30, 40% above the cost curve because there's disruptions. But over the longer term, there are more mines that can get built with, you know, because eventually, presumably some of those mines will be permitted. Eventually some will get through the legal issues. So, it, you know, it's kind of a funnel in terms of what actually gets to production versus what, where can a drill be put in the ground? There's mm-hmm. tons of drills put in the ground many don't find anything some do and then you know there's the next issues Mm -hmm. and so you're very right with um in terms of certain deposits will have issues Mm -hmm. but at the same time that's one point on the supply side but price is the driver in the end that's true oh it's very true how long would you, could you, you said 350 to $4 that you think that's a reasonable price for cop, copper to settle at. How long would you expect co- copper to stay there? Is it like 5 or 10 or 20 years? Well, com- prices in general and commodity prices staying at one point is always a bit of a impossibility just in terms of, you know, there's always changes in expectations and so it never stays. But how long could we have a, a higher price environment? Well, five years, not off the table. 
I mean, a sustained higher price environment. But, but what that could mean is, you know, if price goes to 270, then price goes to 350, then 270, then four dollars, then three dollars. That would that would fit the bill yeah. for me because that's higher prices. And so, none of that, no, at no part of that, was the price staying in in a spot just because that's generally not what prices do. But in terms of, yeah, that could that could last an extended period of time until you get the capital sunk and then it's over. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's how it works. Um, just in terms of, you know, once too much money is spent, it's over. So from here on, uh, me and DV talked about uh, like kind of like his strategy on copper. You know, his copper stocks, if he owns any or do- doesn't. I mean, we're about to see when he plans to buy, when he plans to sell, what he's buying, what he's selling, and so on and so forth. And uh, he even also commented on the copper stocks that I have on my watch list. So if you want to watch uh, and or listen to the full interview, again, please visit baby-investments.com, 100% free, and you find a full podcast on there. Uh, and even if you're interested in copper and, and for any reason want to see what stocks I'm watching, you can find that on the on the website as well. But please understand that I'm very early in my learning journey and there will be many flaws in what I do, including in the stocks that I watch, okay? But yeah, I... I have my copper watch list up on a website, and uh, I also publish copper-related content like videos, other podcasts, articles, and, and news that I read, and it, uh, it generally gets updated daily, I'd say, yeah, I'd say daily. So, uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Your support really means a lot.